that's why it was kind of interesting when Lucas brought it back in Star Wars. Yeah. Because those were techniques that sort of Lawrence Arabia came along and just destroyed. We're going to do quick cuts. We're going to make images. We're going to go from one scene to another by having a proposed image that will connect the two. Mm -hmm. It will be seamless, but it will be jarring at the same time. They have tons of shots like that in the movie. It's just amazing. But it's so, like, it's second-hand now because it's been robbed so much. It's sort of like, it's it's sort of Citizen Kane, but more watchable to me. Because Citizen Kane... Sure, it's the greatest movie of all time, but (laughs) only because it, like, did everything that a modern movie does now. Yeah. But there's nothing riveting about it when you watch it. Because it's telling a good story, I'm still riveted by uh, Lawrence Arabia when I watch it. The the arc that the, the, that he goes through as a character, yeah. you see him die right away, and you're like, well, what are they going to do? Make me care about him? Yeah. No, no, <laughs> no. You kind of get pissed at him. Actually. You get upset with him. You wonder why he's doing what he's doing, yeah. and then he becomes Does elusive he yeah. and vague as a person. And things happen to him, and they don't show what really happens to him. The scene where he either gets castrated or raped. Oh, nobody's really sure what yeah. happened to him. Yeah. They know he was very different after he came back from there, but... When he was severely beaten by the Turks, right? When yeah, they but they, d- they don't know what they did to him. Yeah. He, he definitely changed his war strategy oh, yeah, after that. Yeah. No prisoners! Yeah. No prisoners! No prisoners! Ah! Right when you think you're going to get to like him, he changes. And it, it's such an elusive character to... It's it's interesting because he starts out kind of like uh, this egotistical, like idealist, and then like you said, he changes eventually. He, he kind of starts to lose it towards the end. Also, he tries to back out a few times, and they talk him right back into it. But it's like they put almost no pressure on him. It's like he just he wants to do it, and he wants them to kind of beg him to do it or force him to do it. See, I actually read up on everything after I saw the movie. I was like, well, this is pretty interesting. There was some that said he was possibly a sado masochist. Just explain why he liked to uh, hold a match down to the very bitter end, and why he didn't scream much when he was getting beaten by the guards in the Turkish prison. But that those are theories that spring out of watching the movie and not knowing Lawrence yeah. himself. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. The movie nobody truly knew him. Yeah. You know, and he ultimately fails at his goal. He says he's going to give Arabia to all these people, and ultimately he fails because they can't see the eye to eye at all. There's all these tribes. And, it's well, okay. Do we want to talk about what? the movie's trying to do. It's a very deep movie, and it's three and a half hours. It's trying to show characters justifying colonialism at the same time as running into the problems Mm. of justifying colonialism. Mm. The whole Middle East, the way it's divided up right now, was was, that was all, all those borders were shaped by Britain. Um, Most people don't realize that. Those borders didn't exist. They were made. And Britain did the same thing to Africa, and they did it sort of and justifies the means where we're going to give these people what they really need, even though it's going to kill them mm-hmm. to get there. But that that's something that's in the movie. It's an element, but it isn't what the movie's about. The movie's about how you never really know somebody mm-hmm. and how no matter what you want to be, life is going to turn you into something. And in that, an and in that way, and in, and in that way, in the oddest way, it is just like Best Worst Movie. Because life is going to turn you into what it's going to turn you into, regardless of what you want. You have no want. say in the matter. Yeah, you have no say in the matter. <laughs> it was that way for Lawrence, and it was that way for the dentist. <laughs> what I will say about it, if you love cinema, if you love cinematography, oh then, yeah, that was then watch Lawrence. That Ray caught Ray. my eye. That was the main. It, thing it that was tough. My eye. It's a tough movie to suggest to everyone because some people will just be bored by it, mm. um, and that's fine. Whatever. I mean. It's a frustrating movie, too. I get, as odd as it sounds, I get more bored by movies that are just 80 minutes if they're not about something that I'm interested in. Hmm. I'll sit through a three-and-a-half-hour movie if it's interesting me. Yeah. This movie is its one of my movies that I just like, and I don't want to figure it out. It's my favorite of David Lean's. Mine, too. Because it's the only one you've seen. <laughs> so far, yeah. You actually might like... Bridge Over River Kwai a little better because it's more traditional yeah. in its storytelling. The bridge on the River Kwai. The picture that must be seen and seen again for the suspense of its drama, for the courage of its fighting men, for the humor of its story. Uh, you would hate Chivago, I think. 
And and rightfully so. I'm not crazy about it either. Oh, okay. And he's got other movies that don't hold a candle to those three. He always... Of course, his cinematography was always amazing, but... Yeah. That's the main thing that caught my eye about uh, Hornets of Arabia is the cinematography. All the shots of the deserts and the plateaus. It's still better than a lot of stuff you've ever seen. A lot of care went into it. I think the only guy who's trying to do that level of cinematography right now is uh, that nutcase. Uh, he's the guy who like, goes into hiding after every movie. Uh, not Terry Gilliam, but the other one. Terrence Malick. Say? Terrence Malick is about the only guy who's trying to do what Dave, David Lean does right now. Terrence Malick's cinematography is always just out of the park. The storytelling's weird, though. David Lean, like, the storytelling's very traditional, mm-hmm. so... I, I prefer him to Malick, but whatever. <laughs> Who cares? You you sat through it. I was more impressed that you sat through it than anything, actually. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what, do you think I have ADD? No, it's just... It's a movie that you can give up on and people will forgive you. Mm-hmm. I don't judge people who don't like it. There are movies that I will, if you don't like it, I hate you. <laughs> For the first half of the movie, I was really like into it. They started to lose me in the second half a bit. Uh, Did you laugh at the end when the doctor keeps yelling outrageous at that and at the hospital that doesn't have running water and people are dying everywhere? Yeah, I did, and actually. And he keeps going, <laughs> outrageous! This is outrageous! Outrageous! Every time I see that, I laugh. And it's funny that Lawrence laughs, too. He does. <laughs> but, <laughs> I did laugh at that. I did. <laughs> His conditions are outrageous. <laughs> and then you just keep saying outrageous to anybody that'll look at him. Yep, yep, yep. Outrageous! Yeah. Yeah, I did I did get a kick out of that. It, it's com it's comedy at a point you weren't expecting comedy, yeah. I think. Well, um, it's like it's like a like a dark point of the film because uh, he realizes he, he failed in his personal mission to unite uh, Arabia. Well but And isn't that pretty much the point where he just says like, Yeah, I'm done. I think the point of that is that your personal mission is irrelevant to what you do in your Mm -hmm. life. Uh, It isn't about achieving what you wanted. It's just about what did you achieve. I think he was a great man. And what legacy did you leave behind? I think he was a great man based on what he did. He did a lot of great things. He murdered a lot of people too, I guess. But yeah, I I was researching it. The only part of the movie they said is completely factual. uh, Is when they massacre those troop, the Turkish troops that are like. uh, Leaving oh, so it. going to Aqaba through the desert isn't... That was all made up? I don't... I, the movie kind of blends stuff. It blends characters. Like, it'll take two or three different characters and form them into one. Yeah. For him to interact group. with. Yeah. Um, I don't... You don't I, know? The whole Aquaba thing wasn't as big a deal. It wasn't as, as heavily fortified or anything. Yeah. But they just needed to, like... He, they needed to show... Uh, that he could accomplish things that yeah. he set his mind to. It's a great sequence. I like that he goes back for that guy and then <laughs> the guy turns out to be not worth saving. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> no man left behind. Yeah. Oops. I, I'm glad you got through it. Uh, I'm not going to suggest it to anyone who listens to the show. Yeah, I don't think I'd watch it again. I've seen I've it once. I've seen it ten times, oh I think, my God. at least. You know what? I will. I would watch it again. Um, they restored it on a Blu-ray. They color corrected it. They've remastered it. Yeah. They've pieced it back together. I would watch the fully restored version because the version that you have, um, there's a lot of issues with the disc. Not, not with the disc itself, but with the the way. That they was the first, and maybe this says something about me. That was the first um, DVD I ever bought. Really? This DVD. Yeah. You were, you told me that, and then I try to remember what the first one I bought and. Since I own infinitely more than you do, I was kind of hard pressed to remember that. Yeah. But no, um, uh, I was. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't the first DVD that I bought because it's my favorite movie. Because that isn't the case. It was the first one where I was like, "Let's see if DVD is worth all this hype about visual yeah. clarity and everything." This was like the visual standard for me, and you can understand why. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but that's all irrelevant. As somebody that constantly upgrades his collection. Yes, I completely understand that. <laughs> but, alright, going into the next show, because yeah. we've talked way too long about this. Well, um, we'll pare it down. I drew The Untouchables. Want to get Capone? Here's how you get him. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. That's how you get Capone. And you drew Vigilante. 
time is running out. You're not safe anymore. Their numbers are growing. And you must wage a war to eliminate the problem. Yourself. Vigilante. Untouchables, um, I pick that because you don't, you've time and again said that you don't like gangster movies. And this is one that I think is palpable, palpable? Palpable, yeah, Palpable to someone who doesn't like the genre. It's a Cliff Notes version of a gangster movie. Um, it hits all the emotional highs and lows that you need. It does it in a two hour frame instead of like, you know, Godfather length. <laughs> and it's not as, um, all over the place is something like something that Martin Scorsese would do. Yeah. So there's that. And I have Vigilante, Vigilante. which uh, has. It uh, stars Robert Forrester, also has Fred the Hammer Williamson, and Shaft. directed by. No, that's not Shaft. Who's Shaft? Richard Roundtree. Okay. Shut your right. mouth. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know your Fred black exploitation. Yeah, I don't. I don't know my black exploitation. <laughs> it's okay. It's actually, I'm really behind on my black exploitation, to be completely honest. Truthfully, I've only dipped a toe in. Yeah, a lot of them suck. The whole thing, the whole reason there's black exploitation is because there were black cinemas that would, and that would show, black movies, like in black neighborhoods. And what's ironic is it was kickstarted by white filmmakers. Well, yeah, they wanted to make shaft. A, yeah, they wanted to make a buck. A great thing came out of it. I mean, these were grindhouses. Oh yeah. And they, they wasn't just about black exploitation there. I mean, they had a huge martial arts. Oh, thing. That, I mean, a lot. There's a lot of genres that came out of the fact that there were these theaters that would show certain types of movies. Oh yeah. That we're thankful for now. So no, I'm I'm not against the black exploitation film. I just haven't seen enough of them. No, the big ones are easily obtainable. You could get all the Shaft movies. You could yeah. get. You, I just Blackula. saw. Blackula. Which I thought when I, I, I have like seen that, that one. I have seen it. I haven't seen it. And the I sequel. thought because of its title alone it would be tongue in cheek, but it's very it's straightforward. It's very straightforward. Yeah. If you want tongue in cheek and uh black and sign is more your speed, but that one is really bad though. But yeah. Vigilante, uh Fred the Hammer Williamson. Who was in the original Inglorious Bastards, uh, original Gangsters, uh, From Dusk Till Dawn. Yeah. He's got a great body of work. I met him once. He's a really cool guy. I wonder if he'll ever get his movie, uh, Old School Gangsters, off the ground. Time will tell, I suppose. And then it's directed by William Lustig, who did the Maniac Cop oh, series. Yeah, he's a great director. So, apparently a kind of a lunatic. God forbid you are the person that snaps the rights of a film out from under him, because he will come after you with a baseball bat. Really nice guy, though. I met him once. <laughs> that should be the title of the show. I met this guy once. I met this guy once. Yeah, I know. Yeah. This was uh, much much more of a ramble than I wanted it to be. This should be a Halloween show. But, much like Lawrence of Arabia, we set out <laughs> to organize Halloween and it just got away from us. Yeah, our next one will be a little more with it. I think so. Yeah. What and are we doing next time? I mean, we covered Universal Monsters. Why don't Monsters. we pick something that doesn't span 35 years? So we shouldn't talk about Vincent Price, then. Why don't we talk about Hammer Films? I like the idea. They got it right. Then they got it right. They got it right. And then they closed up shop, but now they're back. They made a really good movie that I like that you haven't seen yet. What's that? Let Me In. Oh, I've seen Let the Right One In. No, 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 forget about that. With Doden, or whatever his name is. Don't, don't, no. The Swedish one sucked. And they also, they've done three movies so far. They did uh, Let Me In. They did uh, The Woman in Black. Which was atmospheric, but in the end it wasn't that scary a movie. Is it good? It's okay. It's got Daniel Radcliffe. Yeah. And it's like a spooky haunted house movie with like this ghost that murders people. I wanted to see it. I I thought the poster looked nice. It's Like I said, it's very atmospheric, but it's PG-13. It's really tame. But they just did another one. If Stallone has proved anything, you can't just try to recreate the genre. And then they also did The Quiet Ones, which just came out last month, I believe, on DVD and Blu-ray. So I know nothing about that. It's another like haunted house type movie, I think. I think they should just go balls to the wall and just do something they used to do. Fake blood and all. Bring back the real hammer horror. Yeah. The satanic rites of Christopher Dracula. Lee's still around. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so that's So what Hammer we'll Horror, that's what yeah, we're talking about next idea. time. Thank you. I'm glad hammer. I'm proud of it. It'll be hammer time. And then uh, we'll talk about Fred the Hammer Williamson. Yeah, hammer time. See it all works together here. Everything just comes together. Yeah, but this is how you end a show. <laughs> this is how you end a show. 
All right, so we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening, guys. Later.